On today's episode, we'll be covering Mexico City's little old lady killer, Juana Barraza. In the early 2000s, Mexico City was terrorized by a monster who was specifically targeting abuelitas. El Mataviajitas, or the little old lady killer, wreaked havoc on the area and nearly gave the police a run for their money. Up until then, the Mexican authorities have never heard of a female serial killer, and their insistence that their culprit was a man would lead them on a wild goose chase only for them to discover that their Mataviajitas had been right under their noses the whole time. On November 25th, 2002, a woman named Maria de la Luz Gonzalez Anaya heard a knock at the door of her apartment in Mexico City. The 64-year-old woman answered and saw a social worker who flashed their government ID badge and told her they were there to help her fill out financial aid papers. The next day, Maria's lifeless body was found lying on her living room floor. It appeared she had been attacked and beaten, and bruises indicated that someone had wrapped their hands around her throat. Police found that her home had been robbed, but couldn't find any trace of the culprit. They didn't know it at the time, but she would be the first of many victims to turn up in the area who had crossed paths with the suspect named by the papers as El Mata Viejitas, or the old lady killer. The next victim to turn up was 84-year-old Giromina Leon Oropesa, who was found in a similar condition as the first victim in March of 2003. The newspapers speculated that this was the latest victim of El Mata Viejitas, and that he would soon strike again. But the police? Nah, they didn't buy it. They didn't seem to think that the two bodies of the old ladies were connected. Within a matter of months, however, four more elderly women turned up who had all been strangled after seemingly welcoming the slayer into their home. Money and valuables had been stolen from each of the homes, and police were beginning to think that maybe the wild speculation of an old lady slayer wasn't so far-fetched after all. Fingerprints at the scenes helped link the crimes together, and police believe the suspect tricked the elderly women into trusting them and letting them inside. When the bodies of two more elderly victims turned up at the end of 2003, the police had finally managed to get some accounts from eyewitnesses. They claim seeing a broad-shouldered person dressed in a female nurse's uniform hanging around the area on the days the women were attacked. The description was just vague enough to where the police believed it was still a male suspect, so they produced two versions of a police sketch. In both drawings, sketch artists depicted the stern-faced suspect based on the accounts, one with more masculine features and the other with more feminine features. But at the time, they only said that this was a person of interest and didn't want to say this was their potential El Mata Viejitas because they didn't want to cause a panic. In the beginning of 2004, Mexico City's Justice Department of Chief, Bernardo Batiz, officially announced that without a doubt, El Mata Viejitas was definitely real. So now they were allowed to officially panic. In that next year alone, El Mataviajitas slayed 14 more abuelitas, taking her body count up to 20. At every crime scene, the women were all found to have been strangled, sometimes by hand, or sometimes with a belt, piece of clothing, or a stethoscope. On top of that, the stethoscope was another helpful clue for the investigators after the reports of someone wearing a female nurse's uniform near the crime scenes. Still, at this point, the authorities refused to say the gender of the suspect because they couldn't imagine a woman being behind these violent crimes. By 2005, the authorities were distributing pamphlets among the elderly, urging them not to open their doors, especially at night, because the monster of Mexico City could be gracing their doorsteps very soon. With more pressure from the public mounting to find their monster, the authorities turned to the help of psychological profilers to see if they could come up with a direction to search for their psychopath. After examining different perpetrators, they concluded that they were looking for a man with homosexual preferences, victim of childhood physical abuse, who lived surrounded by women. He could have had a grandmother or lived with an elderly person, has resentment to that feminine figure, and possesses great intelligence. Despite the multiple accounts of a broad-shouldered woman with short hair in the nurse's uniform, the authorities were like, mm, 
nope, can't be a woman, must be gay. They believed part of their suspect's MO was dressing up as a female nurse to win the trust of their victims more easily, which also fit the profile they'd come up with of a gay man who grew up surrounded by women. This would also explain why the eyewitnesses had described such a masculine looking woman leaving the scene. This one incorrect assumption about their suspect would end up stalling the entire investigation, while potentially costing many more old ladies their lives. One night in June of 2005, 78 year old Maria Guadalupe Nunez Almanza heard a loud knock at the door. Wary of who it could be, she heard the visitor announce themselves as a nurse from a local community care project doing their rounds in the neighborhood, and she felt it was safe enough to open the door. On her porch stood 46-year-old Juana Barraza. She was a stern-looking woman with masculine features. She had a clipboard in one hand and a stethoscope around her neck, and informed Maria that she was offering health checkups that could potentially qualify her for some government aid. Maria said the abuela equivalent to, oh hell yeah, I'm in, and allowed Juana inside. She sat herself down in an armchair and watched as the nurse took out her tools. A few seconds later, the nurse walked to the back of the chair, put the stethoscope around Maria's throat, yanked tightly, and waited until Maria stopped moving. El Mataviajitas had just claimed her 30th victim. At this point, the authorities were still calling their suspect an L. But we all know it's a woman, so for clarity's sake, I'm gonna switch it over now to law. Juana Barraza looted her 30th house, taking what she could find of any value, then ran off into the night. Even though the sketches bore a resemblance to Juana, she probably was feeling pretty invincible about the fact that the police had been pursuing a male cross-dressing suspect the whole time. No one ever suspected this quiet, middle-aged, single mother of four was the vicious monster behind the attacks. But Juana Barraza was no ordinary woman. She looked tougher than most and was a semi-pro lucha libre wrestler. Throughout much of her adult life, Juana graced the TV screens across Mexico under the ring name La Dama del Silencio, or the Lady of Silence. But even though her wrestling days were behind her, she continued to stay in decent physical shape and kept her hair cut short on her head. Because of the short hair and what police described as a robust body type, this continued to confirm the police's bias of their suspect's gender. She was just androgynous enough for the police to continue to believe their suspect was a cross-dressing male theory and was just feminine enough to walk around in public completely undetected. By now, it had been three years of Juana Barraza's reign of terror, and the police launched a special task force when the mother of a famous criminologist was strangled in her own home. The task force launched an operation to catch their suspect once and for all, and began mapping out the areas that La Mata Viajitas was most active and the cops increased their patrols in these places. They believed that their suspect also made a habit of frequenting parks where they could potentially befriend the victims or offer to help them carry their groceries to their houses. The cops hired a bunch of old ladies to go and hang out in parks to see if they could use them as bait to trick La Mata Viejitas to reveal themselves. Unfortunately, that didn't work. The task force would be heavily criticized for what they chose to do next when they decided to round up and arrest every transgender or cross-dressing person they could find. They arrested 49 sex workers and took their fingerprints and what a shock, none were a match. The police were immediately ridiculed and condemned by the press and the public for this Einstein move. In the meantime, the Lady of Silence was on a roll, claiming two more victims in September and October of 2005. But then, for some reason, she just stopped. For the next three months, the Lady of Silence continued to give them radio silence. The investigators didn't know what to do with this. So in the meantime, they made this creepy 3D plaster model based off of more recent eyewitness testimonies of a large woman seen leaving one of the scenes. When this didn't generate any leads, they wondered if their slayer had taken their own life and started fingerprinting the corpses that came into the city morgues. But finally, on January 25th, 2006, 
the Lady of Silence's reign of terror would come to an end. As a resident was returning home one night, he saw a suspicious looking woman leaving his house. He shared the house with his landlady, and like all of Mexico City, was very aware that they had a serial slayer on the loose with a passion for abuelitas. So he alerted two passing police patrolmen in the area while the woman attempted to make a run for it. Thankfully, the police were able to catch up to the stocky woman dressed in white and threw her in the back of the squad car. By the time they got inside the house, the landlady, 82-year-old Ana Maria de los Reyes Alfaro, was gone. But she would be La Mata Viejita's final victim. When the authorities searched Juana Barraza's apartment, they found newspaper clippings she'd cut out and saved from her crimes, and they knew they found their woman. No one had any idea that Juana Barraza, who had been featured on local TV just one week earlier to discuss her wrestling career, had been the one behind the brutal attacks. And also, not a single person, officer, or any of the alleged witnesses had recognized her from the sketches that resembled her. People were shocked to see the middle-aged woman who resembled the bust and the sketches, yet successfully evaded capture for three years. While she claimed to reporters she was just looking for laundry work at her last victim's house, the police had already matched Juana's fingerprints to 10 of the crime scenes. In the spring of 2008, Juana Barraza went to trial, where the prosecution alleged she'd claimed the lives of up to 40 abuelitas. She only ever admitted to strangling that one final victim when she was caught. But the evidence was all there, and she received multiple life sentences for her crimes that totaled up to a whopping 759 years in prison. Under Mexican law, the maximum sentence Juana Barraza will be allowed to serve is 50 years. But she was 50 then, so safe to say, we won't be seeing more of her anytime soon. So until next time, hug your grandmother's tight for me. We'll see you next time.